Our new opera is finished, and thankfully with a minimum of quarrelling between myself and Gilbert, who has at last managed to produce a straightforward story without one of his topsy-turvy plots. But we still cannot agree on the title. Gilbert is convinced that we should call the piece the, the Beef Eaters. He thinks it a good, sturdy, solid name, which it is. It's also very ugly. I shall insist that the title be changed to The Yeoman of the Guard. license of two eminent Victorians caused the world to believe that this man at the Tower of London is a yeoman of the guard. He is not. It's all the fault of Gilbert and Sullivan. They renamed their operetta the Yeoman of the Guard. And we are not Yeoman of the Guard. We are entirely a different body. We are the Yeoman Warders and Waiters of Her Majesty's Royal Palace and Fortress, the Tower of London. Now, everybody calls us beef eaters, and we don't really like this. It's a slang word. It's something like calling an American a yank. The yeomen of the guard are military men. These aren't them either, but their discreet headquarters are here, in a cloistered courtyard of the Palace of St. James. A small brass plate reveals their true function and eternal source of pride. They are the monarch's bodyguard. century, so I'll, I will read it very slowly, and I will want you to say after me, I, Lincoln Perkins, Mel Thompson, sincerely promise and swear, sincerely promise and swear, to serve Her Most Sacred Majesty, to serve Her Most Sacred Majesty, Elizabeth II, Elizabeth, Elizabeth II, the Second. Queen Defender of the Faith, Queen, Queen Defender, Defender of the Faith, her heirs and successors, her heirs and successors, both faithfully, both faithfully and truly, and truly, in the place and office, in the place and office, I am now called unto. I am now called unto. No oath of loyalty anywhere is more solemnly sworn. There are just 66 of them, all men who've served the armed forces with distinction at the rank of sergeant or above. They must measure at least 36 inches around the chest. They must join before they're 55 and retire at 70. Prejudicial, Prejudicial. Or, hurtful or hurtful to Her Majesty's person. To Her Majesty's person. All these things, all these all these things, things I shall truly, I shall truly, I shall truly faithfully, and obediently, faithfully and obediently keep and perform. Keep and perform. So help me God. So help me God. Good. I congratulate you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You will get a copy of that oath, so that you will know the detail of it. It's very lengthy, and I'm afraid the English isn't always quite what one would expect these days. So you'll get a copy of it. Thank you very much, please. Archer. Yes. To your man, left two. Quick, march. Well, we're looking rarely for, for, for four people who have uh, seen a fairly active life, as opposed to a fairly sedentary life. Uh, we look for people who have had experience in some sort of campaign, although this is becoming increasingly difficult. Uh, but um, 
he's got to be a f f sort of fighting soldier, really. A single wall in St. James's Palace exemplifies their history. The partisans, the long pikes they've shouldered into a nuclear age. The escutcheons of the royal houses they've protected. These are the living relics of 500 years of unbroken service to the crown. They were raised on the bloodiest of battlefields by Henry VII in 1485. From then till now, they've guarded 22 kings and queens. Their role now, since they bear no firearms, is ceremonial. They appear only on state occasions, starting each November with a state opening of Parliament. Get yourself Yes, You're going to search for cellars? Yes, we are. So see if we can find you another guy for. Yes. Some Novembers ago, in 1605 to be precise, it was the yeoman of the guard who marched Guy Fawkes off to the tower and execution. He'd been apprehended with matches, fuses and 36 barrels of gunpowder in the Parliament cellars, which was fortunate for King James I. The cellars have been searched every year since then. Queen's bodyguard, attend Chuck. Queen's bodyguard present, sir. Exxon, please start the search. Sir. Queen's bodyguard, pick up thy lanterns. Left turn. Queen's bodyguard, slow. In their first 500 years, the Yeomen of the Guard have had 92 captains. Since the 19th century, this has been a political appointment, designated automatically to the Government Deputy Chief Whip in the House of Lords. The present captain is the Earl of Swinton, so is he ultimately responsible for the Queen's life? No, thank goodness, no, no, it's purely ceremonial these days. So, so I mean, if there is a threat to her, I mean, wh what are your men expected to do? I mean, they are the bodyguard, surely. Well, uh, yes, this is very interesting. I mean, I, I sometimes have wonderful uh, thoughts that somebody at a, a, a state visit or something is going to produce a pistol and I'm going to leap forward in front of Her Majesty and die in my moment of glory. But <laughs> I think that's about all we could do. I don't think we could um, uh, somehow attack a, a, a modern assassin with, with partisans or anything like that. Now, you're captain of the oldest military body in the world. Do you have any military experience yourself? Absolutely none. 
This is what worried me, because I thought they'd look on me. I'm not, I, as you see, I haven't got exactly a sort of military type of figure. And I thought they might disapprove of this, but in fact, they, they were marvelous. And, and uh, doesn't seem to be any at all. They, they seem to have taken me to their hearts, which is, you know, marvelous. Between them, the 66 present yeomen hold 540 medals and decorations. There is a story, I don't know whether it's true or not, about one of my fairly recent predecessors, uh, who apparently was very worried that he hadn't got any, any medals. And the sergeant major, who had quite a number, said, well, wear a few of mine while you're the captain. I shan't miss them. But I think that's probably apocryphal. But yeah. You've no, not done that? No, I haven't. No, I did. Though. It's really done. <laughs> This search is clearly ceremonial. If we discovered a, an object that looked very much like a bomb, we'd probably drop parties down and none like hell. <laughs> oh! There used to be a wine merchant who had a shop in the House of Lords. And it was a thank you from the, the, the House of Lords to the bodyguard for ensuring that all was safe underneath in the bowels. And we used to participate of a glass of port. Then, for some unknown reason, it ceased. And then, approximately four years ago, much to our pleasure, it was uh, restored. And consequently, we uh, retired to a room after the search and participate in a, a glass or two of excellent port. Queen's bodyguard, slow, march. A bit quicker than last time, there. <laughs> we do take an oath to protect the Queen. And I believe that we would fulfill that oath with the same dedication that the Queen promised when she came to the throne 30 years ago. The Queen promised that she would, I can't quote her word for word, but the essence of it was that she would dedicate her life to the good of her people. Now, in that sense, it wasn't intended to indicate that she would lay down her life, but she would spend and devote her life and her work in lifetime to the good of the people. I can't quote the words now, but you probably remember this kind of sentiment. And I believe that I could or would wish to uphold my duty to the Queen with the same dedication. But to the extent of dedicating your life, to if, it, if it came to that? Yes, without sounding dramatic, if they came to that, so be it. The twelfth day after Christmas, the Chapel Royal in the courtyard within St. James's Palace. They gather for the oldest service in the Christian faith the Feast of Epiphany, the giving of frankincense and myrrh and gold. In this case, the Queen's gold. No monarch has attended this service for more than 200 years. It has been so since the sudden death of a daughter of King George II prevented the king from attending. But in this book is recorded his command that the yeoman should continue to stand guard. 
By the front, slow. Pot. When you first entered the chapel, then, I was always impressed by the ceiling, to be quite honest. It's a beautiful little place, and the first thing you see down a rather short aisle is the altar with the gold plate. And this is truly magnificent, and must be very, very valuable. But its true value is, of course, not in the gold content, which is however great, it is in the history behind this plate. And one feels a little awed when you see this in such a small chapel. The gold, frankincense and myrrh are born into the Chapel Royal, the very cradle of English church music, by the Queen's representatives. They are gentlemen ushers, on this occasion a naval captain and a colonel in the lifeguards. The frankincense and myrrh are still obtained from Ethiopia by the Queen's apothecary. Every officer of the guard down five centuries is commemorated here in fine copperplate, headed by the Earl of Oxford. It could be a risky job. 
two captains were executed, including Sir Walter Raleigh, the Sir Walter Raleigh, the 19th captain and probably the most venturesome of the lot. Sir Walter's roving eye, to put it one way, was to land him in some fearful scrapes, none more so than his dalliance with one of the first Queen Elizabeth's so-called maids of honour. Their liaison did not escape the attention of John Aubrey, precursor of the modern gossip columnist. He loved a wench well. One time, getting up one of the maids of honour up against a tree in a wood, who seemed at first boarding to be something fearful of her honour, and modest, she cried, Sweet Sir Walter, what do you me ask? Will you undo me? Nay, sweet Sir Walter! Sweet Sir Walter! Sir Walter! She proved with child, and I doubt not, but this hero took care of them both, and also that the product was uh, more than an ordinary mortal. Good Queen Bess was less than amused. She had Raleigh arrested by his own yeoman of the guard, determined that he should cool his ardour here, in the dreaded bloody tower. Raleigh's first incarceration in this cell, with its ironic message of rebuke, was only brief. Elizabeth released him to go and fight Spaniards and find tobacco in America. Five years later, he was reinstated as the yeoman's captain, only to be re-arrested by them and returned to the tower for 13 years, which gave him ample time to write his history of the world. This time, the charge was treason. Elizabeth was dead, and he'd been prominent in a plot to place Arabella Stuart on the throne. King James was so obsessed by him that he even wrote this tetchy attack on tobacco, a health warning Raleigh should have heeded. Released to redeem himself by discovering El Dorado, Raleigh failed, was flung into the tower for a third time and beheaded. Beds in those days were not always what they seemed to be, hence the promotion of men of proven trust to the offices of yeoman bedgoer and yeoman bedhanger, ancient titles which still exist today. This is a antiquated kind of title, and people read this yeoman bed hanger or bed goer and um, might think that you were selected for your prowess in, in bed or something like that. Unfortunately, this isn't true. It is simply the function of looking after the queen or king and preparing the bed safety-wise to ensure that there was no implements in the bed which could harm or, or kill the monarch. King George II slept here at Hampton Court some 240 years ago. If yeoman bedhanger Hardy had been here then, his duties would have been far from ceremonial, as Sir Julian Paget, the yeoman's historian, explains. Because there was a case, wasn't there, when Henry IV uh, found under his bed a thing called a caltrop, like that, this is a rather small version. It's a genuine one, actually, from the 15th century. And it's what the um, soldiers used to throw under the hooves of horses. Yes. But they must have made a special big one and put it under the king's bed. I think we would agree that this probably wouldn't kill anybody. Uh, it would be very uncomfortable, I suppose, if it was in the middle of your mattress. And if somebody were to leap into a bed, and land on that, he would probably have thought he was, or hoping he was going to land on something a bit more interesting. And uh, it could be painful. <laughs> I think it would do him grievous bodily harm myself. I would think so, <laughs> yes. Well, let's have a look and see what is underneath the bed here. As you can see, there are quite a few layers with the straw on the bottom covered in canvas, which must be the equivalent of the old army palliasse that you and I know. Yes. And then above that is the down, which I suppose is like a modern duvet. And some of the more reliable yeomen, I think, were put on what we call backstairs duty. Yes. They had a rather delicate job, didn't they? Because that was the secret door where the king or queen had their visitors, be they ministers or moneylenders or mistresses. Yes, I mean, they weren't all boring. I mean, the 
ministers and the money lenders were probably boring, but the, the others um, probably had to be even more discreet with. Nell Gwynne, for instance. Well, it's a nice uh, thought that some of your um, previous yeomen might have let Nell, in at, Nell Gwynne in at the back door. Yes, it's just as well they weren't given to blackmail, wasn't it? <laughs> well, I hope they weren't. Thirteen times a year, insignia rewarding bravery, achievement and loyalty are presented at Buckingham Palace. Guests this way please, recipients, frame up. Thank you. For the recipients and their families from all over the nation and Commonwealth, these investitures in the Grand Ballroom are mostly the pinnacle of a lifetime experience. Security, even in here, is paramount. Yeoman always attend, arriving with uncharacteristic modesty in a covered carriage. I remember once we sat in there and I said to the sergeant major, just picture yourself going to Tyburn. What of this? We all thought it was quite funny. The people, the public outside, they, they're highly amused. They absolutely, some of them, they absolutely gape, you know, say, look at those, look. Marvellous this, and uh, we think it's uh, we think it's a good way to be transported to and from the palace. For the yeomen themselves, this is almost a personal day. To mark their 500th year of service, this award from the Queen, Knight Commander of the Royal Victorian Order, goes to the yeoman's lieutenant, Colonel Sir Hugh Brassey. And of course, I was extremely proud. My family was extremely astonished. Astonished? Yeah, I think so. Uh, why was that? Well, I don't think they expected uh, 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 that old father to suddenly be elevated to being a knight. And I certainly, uh, I, obviously, after 21 years' service in the Guard, one knew that something might come along, but one didn't necessarily expect at all that you should be made a knight commander of the Victorian Order.
will stand there for anything up to an hour and a quarter, having first done a little bit of marching into the palace in slow time, up the stairs to the throne room. We're not all in the first flush of youth, I suppose average age in the 60s, and to stand there for that length of time, uh, sometimes your knees begin to lock up and you begin to wonder if, that when the time comes to move, whether your legs are going to work all right. I have a, a knee, a left knee, which always irritates me, and I, I give it a bit of a kick before, on the first step. But having got underway, then I'm all right. We certainly... There were moments when one got quite tired standing. But we didn't have to do much else except stand. And... Uh, one, the, the thing one noticed is the person we serve, Her Majesty, how absolutely wonderful she was, and how she never let up on anything, and how we, we all get older, but how she seems to go from strength to strength. And we certainly are very proud to serve her. We think she's quite wonderful. There are six officers of the Guard. Sir Charles MacGregor, Baronet, when not hill farming in Scotland, carried out duties of great antiquity as Exxon. Actually, I was an Exxon for 15 years. So I've been the lowest of the <laughs> for quite a long time. I don't think it does one any harm. On the other hand, you are quite important because you're a bodyguard of the Queen. And uh, perhaps I was being a little facetious, say the lowest to the low. It's a very honourable position to be the Exxon. Uh, but you're the junior of five officers, and uh, you, do what, you do what you're told. There's nothing very uh, uh, important to being a baronet nowadays. And if we march on, stand to attention. If we march up here and we go in. That's right. Now, to march off, you've got to march off in pairs. And you've got to come behind me. This time, you will do the nod there. You're the right, because I'm going to come down this way. So you nod and you step off. Now, remember to step off. It is you nod on the left foot and you step off on the next one. <coughs> right, ready? Nod now, that's it. Left, right, left, right. What's wrong? You're out of step. Back you go, quickly. Back you go. <coughs> All right, don't worry about it. It comes in very quickly. It's the first time, and then you'll soon get used to it. The power of parade ground command is hardly new to RSM Cyril Phillips, 37 years a soldier, right. former right. Academy Sergeant Major at Sandhurst, and senior warrant officer in the British Army. This is his 14th and Left. final year as right. Messenger Sergeant Left. Major of the Bodyguard. Right. Left, right, left. And now the rate of march at a 100 paces for the minute is because Usually, or mostly the times that you go on parade, you're marching behind Her Majesty the Queen. And she's not going to go marching at 120 paces to the minute. So you go according to the rate of march. Quick, one out, by the front. Quick, march. Left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. Well done, look up. The senior messenger sergeant major is also wardrobe keeper and the only full-time member of the guard. He's submerged in history living, as he's required to, in St. James's Palace. Will some distant successor still be living here in another 500 years? Well, uh, I just wonder what uh, they thought at Bosworth Fields 500 years ago, having walked all the way, they didn't march, but they walked all the way and pulled wheels, wagons, from uh, Wales, from the Welsh coast, up there, and then fought uh, their battles, which they had to do against Richard III, 
and did that. And did they ever think, if anyone said to them, what do you think is going to happen in 500 years' time with us with nuclear bombs and modern weapons and planes and all that? No one knows. But it couldn't get any worse in 500 years than what it is today. England has seen three profound battles in 900 years. The Battle of Hastings, the Battle of Britain, and the battle here on Bosworth Field. It's not forgotten yet. A pox on Henry Tudor! A pox on Baby Henry killer! Tudor. Baby killer! Henry Tudor. I'm King Richard! Death to all traitors! Death to all traitors! You're on a loser. <laughs> 500 years later to the day, the yeomen returned to the battleground on which Richard III, King of England, staked the standard of the House of York and the Plantagenet dynasty. He was 33 years old, feared and hated. Those who threatened his crown, he killed. His opponent was Henry Tudor, leader of the House of Lancaster, and back for what we would now call the showdown after two years in exile. Richard's huge army of 12,000 men held the high ground. Below them, Henry Tudor had less than half that number, a mere 5,000 men. It was a bloodbath over these now rich acres of Leicestershire. It was also the last of the lumbering medieval cavalry charges, and it was heroically resisted by Henry's infantry, formed into tight human wedges. Richard himself thrust his lance through Henry Tudor's standard bearer and killed him, and he seized the standard and for, uh, in that moment, victory was very, very close. At the crucial moment, these 4,000 cavalry charged from where you can see the standard over there at Richard's flank. There must have been one hell of a battle went on with 5,000 cavalry all fighting together. Plus the 4,000 new cavalry belonged to Lord Stanley, who'd been waiting in the wings to see which side to join. Richard never did cry, my kingdom for a horse. He died on foot shouting treachery, understandably, since he thought the Stanleys were with him. His body was thrown like baggage across a horse. It was the end of the Wars of the Roses, the end of the Plantagenet reign, the end of the House of York. As history knows, Henry, the new king, recovered Richard's crown from a thorn bush and pointedly adopted it as his crest. To this day, it's seen on the standard of the Yeoman of the Guard. It was the forerunners of these men who'd stood so unflinchingly at Henry's side. What's more, they still don't use the handy, stay-bright trickery to keep their brasses clean. Oh, no, they still got to do the old spit and polish. Oh, yes, but I don't think I'd be about another 500 years before it comes in here. I should think I'd do anything else. No, 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 it's, uh, it's a uniform, that is. My oh, God, how cool it costs you. Next thing you'll be doing is calling us beef eaters. It is, after all, a, a Tudor uniform, uh, and it is really, you know, commemorating the fact that we were founded 500 years ago in 1485 by King Henry VII, and I think what he said was that the bodyguard would support the dignity and splendor of the English crown for all time. Uh, and I think that today, although we are rather circus horses, if you like, we still represent the great tradition of the British royal family.
They are actually civilians now after years of military service. Some are company directors, some craftsmen, some retired. Yet they remain the oldest military bodyguard in the world. May I have to carry on, The Lord Swinton finds no flaw in their turnout for the next official duty. They're heading for Windsor Castle and the state visit of Life President Hastings Banda of Malawi. They travel by coach, escorted by police outriders who guarantee they won't be late. It's a privileged way to travel. Isn't it just? Uh, here we are, staring through the streets of London at 50 miles an hour and a tremendous coach with these outriders for the Metropolitan Police and the VIP squad indeed. Tremendous, isn't it? We often wonder when the head of state uh, arrives what he's thinking, if he wonders who we are, what we are. But uh, we don't know. I don't suppose we ever will know. The only person who knows is, is the sovereign. And of course, quite naturally, we just can't ask the sovereign what he thinks of us. <laughs> visit was a big honor for Malawi and the people of Malawi. Added to this honor was the fact that our head of state was received in the private home of Her Majesty the Queen, Windsor Castle. Whilst the state visit was on, the role played by the yeoman of the guard was extremely conspicuous and added to the uh, grandeur and pump of the ceremonies that took place. It is therefore proper and fitting that my head of state, His Excellency Dr. S. H. Kamuz Banda, should ask me to convey to the Yeoman of the Guard his sincerest and warmest congratulations on the occasion of the 500th anniversary of the formation of the Yeoman of the Guard. Maybe today they do not actually protect Her Majesty from uh, dangers, uh, but they maintain that ceremonial role that is extremely uh, uh, interesting to many of us who, are, who come from abroad to see their dress, the way they uh, march, the way they carry their uh, swords, <laughs> their spears, uh, is extremely impressive for most of us who have never seen them before. Ripon Cathedral, Yorkshire. The moving service to be celebrated here can be traced back to the 11th century. <laughs> the Queen has come north for a symbolic act of humility and charity. It is her 13th Easter visit outside London for the Royal Maundy Service. Until the first Queen Elizabeth, the monarch used to wash the feet of the poor. Today, the second Queen Elizabeth, somewhat more hygienically, 
distributes purses of Mundi money to those who've served the church and community. Purses contain specially minted coins, and the recipients number twice the monarch's age and years. Here at Ripon, 59 men and 59 women. A church has stood on this site since AD 672. What follows within its towering nave is a service of ageless significance and high emotional intensity. I had a new hat, and I, you can adjust them inside, which I, I didn't do. I never gave it a thought, really. And uh, on that particular occasion, I had to carry one of the dishes on my head, top of the hat. And we started to, in procession to walk around. The dish got rather heavy, and suddenly, the whole thing went whew, and the hat went down over my eyes. And all I could see was the chap's heels in front. I thought, what am I going to do now? So I thought, well, keep marching, Corfo, and uh, which I did. And they knew what had happened, and for a long time I had my leg pulled about that.
there is also a very, very large, very, very heavy dish. And you have your gloves on, and you cannot grip it properly, you see. As you go along, it gets heavier and heavier, and you go, oh, I'm starting to shake. And you think all sorts of things, and whatever happens, I must not drop it, and you pull it into your stomach. The fragrant posies the children carry are another reminder of those unhygienic days. We were outside the four of us, dish carriers, and the Queen came by with the, the bishop and we saluted and she looked across and smiled and she said, you had, you had a long carry this morning? <laughs> yes, ma'am. The Maundy service over, the yeoman repair to the unicorn. Gentlemen, we knew you were coming today, so we have arranged for beef for you, for the beef eaters. We've talked about you being prepared to lay down your life. No, no, no more. For the Queen. Yeah. Would you do that? Certainly. But no hesitation. What can you actually do? I mean, in the terrible event of the Well, if I saw someone in the crowd or the assassin in the crowd uh, preparing to take a shot or whatever, I'd certainly put myself between him and the Queen and take the bullet or knife. No, no, no. Certainly. No hesitation. And if. Well, nobody, nobody can stop the assassin bullet. And that has been proved in many other countries. But should, at any time, any individual, stupid, and as has happened in the past, somebody insane, attempt to approach Her Majesty, we would take immediate action and uh, do everything we could to protect her, at the risk of our own lives, of course. 
But what, what action could that be? I mean, you well, have I a medieval weapon. Not, uh, I, we don't worry. They, as uh, Corporal Jones said, they do not like it up them. <laughs> Several monarchs owed their lives to the bodyguard. In 1786, Yeoman Francis Kerridge saved George III from a knife attack by the insane Margaret Nicholson. Twelve years later, there were two attempts on his life in a single day. The second, at the Drury Lane Theatre, saw the bullet pass between two yeomen who then calmly arrested the would-be assassin. Even now, yeomen attend the monarch at the opera. You see, I feel that as a humble yeoman of the country stock, I'm part of the history of these islands. I'm part of the heritage of Britain. We've kept it going for 500 years. We are of the people. We were ordained by King Henry VII for the upholding of the majesty and the glory of the throne. That was why we were instituted as the first bodyguard ever on a permanent basis. We maintain it. We're not concerned with monetary values. These have little meaning to us at 100 pounds a year. We're not concerned with promotions. These take perhaps more than 20 years. We like doing it. We love doing it. We enjoy it. We are the backbone of this country. We are the yeoman of the country. And we are the yeoman of the guard. Despite their acute sensitivity to the word beef eater, there's little doubt that it owes its origin to the prodigious appetites of the yeoman of old. Until 1813, 28 pounds of beef, not to mention 18 pounds of mutton and 16 of veal, were the daily rations for just 30 yeomen. They had wine on special occasions, but every day they consumed 37 gallons of beer. Add a few loaves of bread and some other morsels, and the bill, as yeoman John Cawthorne discovered in his local supermarket in Norfolk, would now add up to a little matter of £301 a day. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of booze. I should imagine the monarch must have got... He must have gone to bed terrified. Well, if he knew that half his guard, or, or was supposed to be guarding him, drank all this lot each day. Summertime, the Queen's Garden Party. We're on parade, but in a, should we say, a relaxed manner. You see, the people who go to garden parties, or the majority of them anyway, it's their one and only time that they ever go through Buckingham Palace and into the beautiful gardens. And quite obviously, they, they're so thrilled, they make a day of it. And we're always told, don't forget, it's a once in a lifetime thing for these people. Don't, uh, too much on your dignity, don't snarl at them, etc. Well, we don't. We don't smile and snarl at anybody. Um, our job is more like crowd control, opening the lanes up for the Queen, Queen's Lane, and uh, everything is very, very relaxed. Everybody enjoys themselves. People ask questions, and we try to give them the answers as best we can, and uh, all in all, it's uh, a great family gathering.
Does John Cawthorne think there will still be yeomen to serve such occasions in another 500 years? Oh, yes, I do. Uh, providing that we still have a sovereign, because that is our job, is to guard the crown and the sovereign who wears the crown. And if that disappears, I suppose, well, we probably would. But I can't see that happening, ever. We have got to keep a crown. We have got to keep a sovereign, because that's what holds this wonderful country together. And uh, I am sure that in 500 years' time, whoever in the bodyguard then will be doing the same job as they're doing now. I'm positive of it. High summer, the incomparable pageantry of the garter service at Windsor Castle. It brings together the knights of the oldest order of chivalry in the world, created by King Edward III in 1348. occasion in the calendar of royal ritual, no scene in British public life so vividly evokes the enduring strength of monarchy and the allegiance of those sworn to preserve it. come out to take up their position in all their colourful robes. After which comes out the Queen Mother with her page, looking absolutely wonderful, smiling to everybody, so relaxed, so full of life.
by. I've marched down the procession quite a number of times. And the crowd are just absolutely thrilled and full of the joys of life. They think it's marvellous. All you need is a wonderful day, uh, weather-wise. You get that, you have got everything. It is history in a wonderful historical castle. The setting couldn't be better. The Queen Mother quietly waving to her crowd of her friends because she treats everyone, everyone to her friend. And uh, the crowd clap and cheer, and also the Royal Majesty the Queen as well. And uh, it is a wonderful, relaxed, slow procession. They take their time, looking at everybody, smiling, waving, everybody cheering back, people with cameras taking photographs. It's just really wonderful, it really is. The yeomen are very proud that an emblem on their own standard, depicting the Round Tower at Windsor, was to become the badge of a royal dynasty. This standard is a recent artefact, designed only in 1938 at the command of King George VI. The initial design, while showing the badges of earlier monarchs, bore no visual reference to the House of Windsor. They didn't have a badge. So this one was created by Garter King of Arms but only after a small tussle between Garter and His Majesty. The King, an old naval man, didn't like the initial depiction of the royal standard, Tinny, he called it, and asked for it to be flowing in the wind. A diplomatic compromise was reached. The King approved and Garter kept his job. The standard represents constancy down 500 years. Nothing changes, only the men who serve beneath it. The only change that occurs when we are promoted is that we get presented with a, a different stick by the Queen. And the sticks all look the same, but in fact, on the band around the silver knob here, it says who the stick belongs to. And this one is now as Lieutenant of the Queen's bodyguard for the time being. Uh, so it's not your personal property? It's not personal property, and it will be passed on to every subsequent lieutenant after me. For the time being, a very English definition for the span of another yeoman's years in the unbroken chain of service to the Crown. <laughs> <laughs> 
There's no money in the job to speak of, only pride in guarding those whose existence protects our nation from the forces of political extremism, of social nihilism, of the wanton change which elsewhere parades as revolution. It is this concept, as much as the sovereign's life, that the yeomen stand for. The feeling is reciprocated. The Queen has given them their own parade. One cannot express uh, the feeling of delight in that parade. To be a member of the bodyguard on its 500th anniversary, because there's nothing the bodyguard likes better than marching down the mall with the standard flying and the partisans at the right angle. Everybody marches down with a great swagger, and we are the boys who guard the crown and the sovereign. The Sovereign enters with Lord Swinton, for whom it's not the easiest of days. I never, having not been in the army, I never really had to wear spurs before. And everybody said, you've got to be very careful, because, I mean, they put, whatever it is, that little bit more on, on, on the length of your, your, your boots. And it's very easy to trip up. And I was terrified of tripping down those steps, which I had to go up three times, perhaps breaking my wonderful uh, staff of office which is, would be bad enough, but even worse, landing on top of Her Majesty and scorching her, that gave me, I was terrified to do that. Queen inspects a personal bodyguard, and uh, it, 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 it is a feeling, uh, probably that one cannot express, that uh, she delighted to be inspecting us, and we are delighted that she is inspecting us. Uh, it's more of a, a silent conversation that takes place between the bodyguard and the Queen. We all feel so proud, you cannot put it into words.
great pleasure to inspect my bodyguard every four years here at Buckingham Palace. But today is an extra special occasion. I have just presented your new standard with battle honors and badges going back 500 years to Bosworth Field. Many regiments have been celebrating a decentenary this year, but you have left them all in the shade. If there are few recent battle honors for the Yeoman of the Guard, your presence nowadays at the Mondi service, the Garter service, and other great state occasions means much to me and adds enormously to the color and pageantry for which our country is renowned. My best wishes go to those who serve now in the Queen's bodyguard of the Yeoman of the Guard. And my warm and appreciative thanks to all of those who have served me in this way in the past. Your Majesty, on this great day for the Queen's bodyguard, the highlight is when you presented our new standard to take the place of the one presented to us in 1938 by your father. It will be kept with great care and taken on parade with great pride and is a great honor to us. Your Majesty, we are the same sort of men we were 500 years ago. We are the same sort who have served with deep affection to the crown and to name yourself personally. We continue in that service and shall do so with all loyalty. Your Majesty. The link with 500 years of history is so strong that pride and emotion are evident everywhere. The eyes right if we go past, and everybody looks the Queen straight in the eyes and looks to say, Don't worry, ma'am, we will look after you. Which we would. And so, on a brilliant summer's day at Buckingham Palace, the second half of the Yeoman's first millennium begins. 
These are but reminders from the last 500 years that there remains an institution which inspires undeviating loyalty. It is called monarchy, and these are two men who believe in it. They are called the Yeomen of England, and when one moves on, another simply takes his place. Um, when you discover that they're all correct, you put them in here. Well, I must say that uh, I'm sure you'll get all the loyalty and support that I've had from all the yeomen in the past. And I wish you all the very best of luck. All right. Thank you very much for that. And I'll see you at the dinner. Aged 70, 51 years guard and bodyguard, Cyril Phillips walks erect into retirement. Nope, I think it's all.